Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Hey, all. Welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. As always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Snag your free uh, top 200 study guide. It's a 31-page PDF, and I really highlighted a lot of my uh, clinical practice pearls and a lot of things that that just happen um, actually out in the uh, real world when managing uh, and following medications. So uh, go snag that for free simply for subscribing uh, at reallifepharmacology.com. With that, let's get into the drug of the day today. Uh, that is going to be leflunamide. Brand name of this medication is Arava. And I will say uh, that I, I don't see this medication used a ton anymore. Um, it is uh, primarily used in clinical practice for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and it is an oral uh, DMARD. That's disease-modifying uh, anti-rheumatic drug. Now, why you don't see this medication used, it, it does have some significant warnings associated with it, uh, and I'll, I'll mention those coming up here. Um, but primarily, if you're going to see an oral DMARD being used, you're going to see uh, methotrexate, uh, hydroxychloroquine, and potentially sulfasalazine um, used as well, typically. Uh, before we go to leflunamide. Now, there may be rare cases where we go to it for for one reason or another, Um, but those three drugs, along potentially with the the biologics, uh, are definitely growing in in popularity, which you're probably uh, seeing less and less of leflunamide being used for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, There are a couple of off-label uses, uh, like CMV, cytomegalovirus, uh, BK virus, and those really probably only occur in transplant patients. And personally, I've never seen uh, an actual case where they've been used uh, for that off-label, but if you see a, a quirky off-label use, um, that could uh, be happening out there. Uh, me- mechanistically, uh, this drug uh, blocks pyrimidine synthesis, which ultimately leads to an inhibition of uh, cellular proliferation and Ultimately, the end goal, uh, particularly in rheumatoid arthritis, we're looking to uh, reduce uh, inflammation and inflammatory responses. So ultimately, that's that's what it does. Uh, it is a, a prodrug that, that needs to be, be activated. Uh, interestingly, so we, we've got some uh, dosing things uh, with this medication that are, are a little bit quirky, and one in particular. Uh, so there is the option to do a loading dose. So if you see, you know, a higher than usual or standard dose for a couple of days, uh, that might be a situation where we're doing uh, a loading dose. Now, keep in mind that loading dose might be in the ballpark of 100 milligrams, and we can have chronic dosing in the 10 to 20 milligram range. So we've got to be a little bit careful with our zeros uh, in that situation, recognizing that 100 milligrams might be appropriate for a very short-term loading dose in RA, but we want to make sure that we don't make an error and continue to give that 100 milligrams. Um, Those are the type of things I have seen out in clinical practice uh, where we get mixed up with uh, zeros and things like that. So Uh, If you see that loading dose being used or you know of a specialist that's using that loading dose, uh, be really, really careful and and make sure the the patient's educated uh, on what the appropriate dose is and when they're they're supposed to switch over. So in chronic patients, the dose uh, that I've probably seen most often is 20 milligrams a day. And again, uh, you know, for RA, uh, that's going to be used on a chronic basis to try to uh, reduce the incidence and severity of rheumatoid arthritis flares. Uh, Adverse effect profile, 
Um, most of the patients I've seen this medication on, uh, they've been on it for a long, long time, so they've they've been tolerating it with without issues. Um, but percentage-wise, you know, g- short-term GI side effects, headache, uh, that can definitely result uh, on account of the medication. Uh, also, some you know dermatologic skin reactions, uh, alopecia or hair loss can happen. So those are kind of some general things to to keep tabs on. Now, the the two warnings, there's two um, big boxed warnings with this medication. Again, that's why I said you probably don't see it used uh, terribly often. Uh, In the general population, anybody, uh, we do have to worry about liver toxicity. So that is a boxed warning. And obviously, if we're using this medication, that's something we're going to be looking out for. Uh, the other one is uh, leflunamide is teratogenic, so we absolutely uh, should be avoiding this medication in pregnancy. And that kind of ties in with the monitoring parameters. You know, in female patients of childbearing age, we're obviously going to look uh, and make sure they aren't pregnant or they aren't trying to get pregnant um, because of, of that risk uh, to the fetus. Also, remember, this is uh, or has immunosuppressant activity. So uh, we've got to evaluate for disease states such as like latent TB because if we give an immunosuppressing agent and, you know, we could end up activating uh, tuberculosis to its, to its more active uh, infection state there. Uh, CBC, white blood cell count, I think that's you know kind of self-explanatory, particularly uh, with uh, the mechanism and, and the drug potentially suppressing the immune system, and then of course you know with the boxed warning on LF on liver function tests, we're we're going to monitor uh, liver function as we uh, begin uh, to use this medication and uh, throughout chronic therapy. All right, so let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and we will wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material, like geriatrics, ambulatory care, medication therapy management, pharmacotherapy, uh, newly added um, uh, board certified uh, psychiatric pharmacist practice exam, so definitely go check that out. We've also got NAPLEX content, and we've got a lot of uh, Audible books and Amazon books for you know general practitioners, nurses. Uh, even dietitians, we've got a, a, a guide to uh, food drug interactions. So again, ton of different resources. Uh, all those links are at meded101.com slash store. Uh, please help support the sponsor, whether it's a, you know just the purchase of a smaller book or uh, some of our bigger packages for study materials. So uh, we greatly appreciate uh, you supporting meded101.com. And it helps, obviously, uh, keep this podcast funded and uh, educational for all to enjoy. All right, so let's wrap up with drug interactions for leflunamide. So first off, I want to mention two CYP enzymes. So leflunamide can actually induce CYP1A2. And CYP1A2 breaks down uh, certain drugs and... So when we induce that enzyme, we're, remember, we're ramping it up, we're speeding it up. So uh, drugs like clozapine, uh, caffeine, olanzapine, uh, clomipramine, duloxetine to a certain extent, these are all medications that can potentially have their concentrations lowered if we add leflunamide. Another potential SIP interaction Leflunamide inhibits CYP2C8. Now, in the grand scheme of things, CYP2C8 really isn't very significant. Um, There aren't a ton of drugs, at least at this point, um, that are broken down through uh, CYP2C8. I should say, uh, not a ton of commonly used medications. Uh, I would say probably the most uh, common one that I've seen used is probably piaglitazone which there again, it's got some issues in diabetes, so I don't see it used too much anymore, um, but it can actually increase the concentrations of piaglitazone because leflunamide inhibits CYP2C8. Now, there are a few other rare ones, and I always encourage you, to, if you're not sure, uh, to, to run a drug interactions checker. 
uh, just to get a sense of what we might be uh, doing with the, the medication and the patient's other medications that they're, they're taking. Uh, of course, leflunamide having immunosuppressant activity, we've got to be cognizant of additive effects there. So, you know, probably the most common situation is using corticosteroids uh, in combination with leflunamide. Both can potentially suppress the immune system uh, and maybe increase that risk of uh, infection. Uh, other uh, medications, so bile, bile acid sequestrants, so that's a drug like cholestyramine that can bind up the drug in the gut and lead to lower concentrations of leflunamide and its active uh, prodrug form. And then, of course, lastly, uh, drugs that increase liver toxicity risk or patients with you know medical history that that might be uh, alarming in that situation. So, of course, there I think about you know patients with uh, heavy alcohol history. You know they might have some pre-existing liver damage, and leflunamide might potentially add on to that. Uh, other you know liver toxic drugs, uh, of course, acetaminophen um, generally comes to mind. Uh, methotrexate. A, you probably wouldn't see it used with leflunamide, but um, again, just thinking about uh, those additive effects on the liver and drugs that can cause uh, liver issues. All right, so I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, uh, enjoy the podcast in general, uh, leave a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. That's greatly appreciated. Uh, share us with a colleague, classmate, student, uh, preceptor, uh, whoever you're working around uh, in the field of healthcare, uh, if they uh, need to learn more about medications or need some refreshers, uh, definitely send them our way to the Real Life Pharmacology uh, podcast. Again, support our sponsor, meded101.com. That helps uh, keep our podcast going. And uh, if you want to reach out to me personally, uh, comments, suggestions, or you know to say I made a mistake on something, uh, definitely don't hesitate to reach out, mededucation101 at gmail.com or potentially LinkedIn, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCGP, BCPS. Those are probably the, the uh, two most uh, active spaces that I'm in and probably the easiest way to, to catch me if you've got something to say. I'm going to sign off for today. Uh, thanks again for listening. Hope you picked up a few pearls and uh, we'll catch you another day. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.